All right, back for the second part of this lecture that I broke into two parts because um, I didn't want to take the chance that YouTube wouldn't accept a video that was too long. So, um, and then I, I set that up as a natural break point anyway. We talk about um, integration and you get a little bit about um, athletes' voices in that first half of the discussion question. Now we're about to move on more, um, uh, especially to uh, capitalism and sports. Um, and athletes rights. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's get back. Oh, wait, I gotta share my screen. Share. All right. So once again, there's a discussion question. All right, so let's talk about capitalism and sport. So I mentioned this before, but it really bears repeating. Capitalism, it's always been intertwined with sports, okay? Um, you know, you might hear people talk about, oh, you know, you, you know, players should play for the love of the game. You know, they're playing a kid's game. They should be happy to do that for a living. Or, you know, there's these romantic notions about sports as if they're separate from the real world or separate from money. And that's just not true. Um, it's always been intertwined with sports. We saw looking back into the 1800s, when things were becoming professionalized and there was gambling involved, all those things, right? It's always been there. Um, and usually management was the one to benefit over players. Remember we talked about when the National League formed in 1876, it was the owners of the teams kind of wresting control away from the players, okay? And I, you know, I just want to be clear, you know, these athletes, I should probably have professional athletes here. Um, professional athletes, they're employees, okay? It's their job, you know, they're workers. It might not seem like that because they're playing a game a lot of us play, you know, or I played when I was a kid. But still, that is their job, right? So um, we can't look at this as something separate from the real world concerns of money, you know, things like that. If we've learned anything from this course so far, you know that it's not, right? Sports are not separate from the quote unquote real world. So we talked about the reserve clause, right? Players didn't have any agency. They had no free agency. Okay. They were tied to that team for perpetuity forever. Um, the Players League pops up in 1890, tries to fight it. It gets batted down. The Federal League pops up in 1913. Um, Again, I, I think I mentioned I did my uh, under college senior thesis on the Federal League. It kind of tries to fight against the reserve clause, even though they have reserve clause in their own contract. They do do a, a for a year or so, they do lure a lot of players away from major league teams with a lot of money, um, but eventually they fold too. They only last a few years. Um, so it is challenged before World War I in baseball, right? Maybe uh, have athletes having some more rights over management. Um, but then 1922, baseball is declared exempt from antitrust laws by the Supreme Court. What that means is that there are a lot of businesses in America that, according to the laws of the country, can be regulated to make sure they don't become a monopoly right monopoly meaning you have complete power in one organization over what is sold what is bought all those things right um baseball is declared exempt for that because it's and according to the, the supreme court justices an amusement that, that doesn't constitute inter, interstate commerce according to them in 1922 which is ridiculous right of course baseball is interstate commerce there is commerce happening all the time in baseball and commerce just means trade right um trade of money happening all the time. Now, that's still in effect. Baseball is the only of the major sports that has this antitrust exemption. However, there's been some recent rumblings about trying to challenge that. In fact, there's a, some Senate committee that just sent a letter to Major League Baseball saying, hey, we want to look into this. We don't think everything's right here. So you better get your, you know, your stuff in order and show us that you still deserve this or we're going to take some action. That's happening literally right now in the last couple of weeks. Um, so there are some people starting to push against this right but very clearly owners had not only the upper hand they had the only hand and i'm speaking specifically about baseball here okay um it's true in the other sports as well but especially in baseball because baseball is that antitrust exemption um the only way well let me let me step back there's no such thing as a players unions yet all right so some in the early days in the 1900s some pro players tried to kind of um unite together 
um, to provide to present a united front against management, try to get more benefits for themselves, and never really took. Um, players always um, kind of fell back and saying, "Listen, if we if we you know if we decide to strike, well, we're not how much where are we going to get money from, right? We got to feed our families, and that's a common thing among workers everywhere when they decide whether to strike or not. You know, do we have enough money to get through this strike and still survive? It's a legitimate question. Um, so unionization didn't really work for the players for a long time really the only way to try to get more money from the owners was to withhold your services you say i'm just not going to play for you and the owner could say okay well you're not going to if you're not signing a new contract and you're not going to play fine and if you're a good enough player the the idea was well we have leverage to say i'm so and so i'm a great player this owner needs me for the team to do well and for the team to make more money for him right? You make more money, the better you do usually, um, at least back in this time. So, so well, if I just hold out, they're going to give me a better contract. You still see this sometimes in football, You'll pro football, you'll see players hold out of training camp because they want to get a better contract and they threaten not to play. Actually, usually they come back pretty soon because um, they realize, A, they want to play, like this is a sport, a thing they want to do, um, but B, that the owner is not going to budge as much as they think he would. Um, really, the only there are very few examples of a player really going all the way with this. Le'Veon Bell comes to mind. He held out an entire season looking for more money. Didn't really work out for him uh, the way he thought it would, but usually they come back. And Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale are a good example of this. So you see them up here. You probably heard of Sandy Koufax before, one of the greatest left-handed pitchers of all time for the Dodgers. Don Drysdale, you may not have heard of him, but he was almost as good. Um, big right-handed pitcher, uh, pitched inside a lot, would have no issue with hitting you with a pitch. At one point, he had the record for most consecutive innings pitched, uh, scoreless innings pitched to Oral Hershiser past that about 30 years ago. Um, these guys were studs. They were awesome. They had won some World Series for the Dodgers already, and they're like, you know what? We we deserve more money. You know, we're not getting the raises we think we should. We think we're some of the greatest players in the league. We deserve more money. So what they do is they hold out together, right? They're, they're jointly coordinating this. We're going to hold out. We're not going to come to spring training. We're not going to report to the Dodgers. And they're going to see how badly they need us, and they're going to give us the money we want before we come back. That didn't happen, right? They didn't have solidarity with other players and a players' union to support them. It was just them kind of on their own. The media was against them. You know, usually the media is on the owner's side at this time. It's a little different today, as we'll get into. But the media is on the side of the owner's. So that kind of turns the fans against the players, right? The fans see them as entitled or greedy um, for not coming to training or spring training, and they capitulate. They eventually give in. Um, Koufax and Drys, they'll come back. They have the same exact contract for 1966 as they had in 1965. Uh, that actually turns out to be Sandy Koufax's last season. Um, really, that's due to his, the pain in his elbow he had. But maybe this had something to do with it, too. Maybe he was just tired of trying to fight this uphill battle against the owners. So even into the 60s, players are struggling with this. But then you have a guy, Kurt Flood, comes along, and he's really the one who begins the road to free agency in all the sports, but in baseball first. It comes in baseball first. Kurt Flood is a name that should be better known um, among people. But frankly, I believe he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, he was a good player. He's a very good player. I believe he won eight gold gloves in center field. Uh, if you know anything about baseball, gold gloves – if you want a gold glove at your position, you're supposed to be the best defender at your position in the league. Um, very good center fielder. I don't think he should be in the Hall of Fame for just his playing, though. He's not a Hall of Fame player with his stats, but he's a Hall of Fame person for what he did to change the game. Okay. So I believe it's 1970. Kurt Flood is traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. Yes, the Phillies are involved in this. Um, Dick Allen, if you've heard of him, famous Phillies player, he's actually in the trade that goes back to St. Louis. Dick Allen actually had demanded the Phillies trade him. He wanted to be traded. Kurt Flood's the opposite. He doesn't want to go. He does not want to go to Philadelphia, partially because it still has the reputation back from the Jackie Robinson days of being a very racist city, and he's a black man. Okay, Kurt Flood is black. Um, but also, he just doesn't want to uproot his family, and he doesn't want to be at the whim of owners. He wants to decide where he wants to play, where he wants to work. Right? Is that really much different than me being a teacher deciding where I want to work? You know, Sandy Gustin can't just trade me to Holy Spirit. Like, that's not how it works. I can decide where I want to work. So he's saying, why can't he decide where he wants to work? So the reserve clause says, listen, you've got to either 
play for Philadelphia or not play. So he says, okay, I'm not going to play. So he sits out the 1970 season and he sues Major League Baseball. Okay. And he gets the help of this guy up here, Marvin Miller, who, who is about to, I think he had founded the Players Union a couple of years before this. So the Players Union is very new. Okay. It doesn't have a lot of power yet, but he's on Kirk Flood's side. So Flood v. Kuhn goes to the Supreme Court. No current players help support him there. None come to speak on his behalf. And probably it's because they're afraid that the Major League Baseball owners, right, they're going to sense this threat against them and they're going to blackball the players that help Kirk Flood, a.k.a. they're going to release them and nobody's going to sign them for daring to threaten the owners. Players are really afraid of this. The Players Union just doesn't have the power yet that it needs to do this. Jackie Robinson is really the only guy who helps him. Oh, I heard my little noise. That's my cue. Well, that's a shame. I'm, I'm on a roll right now. All right, stay on this roll here. Jackie Robinson's about to die in a few months. Um, he's afflicted with cancer, I believe it's throat cancer. He is not doing well at all. Okay, but Jackie Robinson comes to the Supreme Court to speak on Kirk Flood's behalf. He loses. He loses a Supreme Court case, and it really turns out to be a tragic again for Kirk Flood. He only plays 13 more games in Major League Baseball, um, and that's it. So he's almost a tragic figure in that way. So it seems like a loss, right? It seems cut and dried. It didn't work. But this plants the seeds for a movement to start in the early 1970s towards free agency. First, we're going to watch a little bit of a video about how this uh, feeds. My problems with baseball. I was telling my story to deaf ears because I was telling my story to a person who would give their firstborn child to be doing what I was doing. And he just could not understand how there could be anything possibly wrong with baseball. For nearly three years, Kurt Flood has been in the court fighting a one man battle with Major League Baseball over the reserve clause. Despite the advice of the players' union, he had left the game in 1969, rather than be traded against his will. What I told him was that I agreed with him in principle, but that the courts had treated players as property and would likely do so again. This is Marvin Miller. That his uh, attempt, well, a principled one, was, uh, I thought, doomed to failure. And I worried about his knowing uh, the kinds of chances he was taking, that he was going to end his career uh, in a case that uh, uh, probably was a loser. The lawyers for the major leagues would not talk for the cameras, but in the courtroom, they argued that the reserve clause is essential to the future of organized baseball, that without the reserve clause, all the rich teams would get all the star players. Well, oh, we've heard that before, back from the 1880s, the first justifications for the reserve clause. Still being used 90 years later. Arthur Goldberg maintains that the reserve clause, tying a player to one team for the rest of his life, is in violation of the 13th Amendment. That's the amendment against slavery and indentured servitude. So that's interesting. Um, we're going to stop it there. That's really interesting. Um, they're using language about holding these players as property, right? When the player can't go where he wants to play, he's being held like property. He's being held like a slave, almost. That might seem like graphic imagery, maybe over the top, and it probably is. But players have been using that imagery for decades. And with Kirk Flood, it, it obviously um, has a little bit more of an impact thinking about that way because Kirk Flood's black. Um, and Kirk Flood... Puts it pretty well there. He says, you know, the fans weren't on my side because the fans sitting there saying, hey, I would play that boys game for free. And you're going to be complaining about having to be traded. Right. That's how the dominant perspective was at this time. But you got to remember, these guys are athletes or they're employees. They're workers. They are generating millions of dollars for Major League Baseball, but yet they can't really negotiate their own value. Um, and so that's really where the problem lies. Kerr Flood loses. Okay, he loses in 1973. He might have lost the battle, but he actually plants the seeds to win the greater war for the players. Um, 
And in case you can't tell, I'm very much on the player side here for Kenny Moore agency. Okay. 1975. All right. These two pitchers, Andy Messersmith, who's on the left here. They've got some wild hair. Dave McNally on the right. Two very good pitchers, two all-star pitchers. They decide with their lawyers that they're going to test the reserve clause. So they're going to sit out a year. And then technically, by the laws of the reserve clause, as we mentioned before, you're supposed to be a free agent after that one year. Owners had used it to just keep re-upping you every single year to have to have control over you forever. But legally, technically, it only controls you for one year. The courts had just never ruled in that favor because for various reasons we've already gotten into, right? So they, they do this. They sit out of here. They do not sign a contract with their teams. They want to figure uh, – the owners want to figure out uh, a solution to this. The Players Association now has a little bit more power. They want to get a solution to this, a once-and-for-all solution. Um, and so what they do is they go to independent arbitration. All right, what that means is both sides will go to one person called an arbitrator. They present their case. Each side presents their case to the arbitrator. The arbitrator renders a decision that is binding on both sides. Okay, both sides have to abide by it. Um, so in a shocking turn of events, in December of 1975, uh, the arbitrator named Peter Seitz actually ruled in favor of the players. He said, look, the reserve clause cannot hold you after that one year. It's one year and that's it. And really the reserve clause, should that's not really even legal either. Okay, it destroys the reserve clause, which means free agency. Now, the players are and owners are both savvy enough to realize if you every player were a free agent every single year, that would be chaos. Okay, as much as I advocate for player agency, I recognize that that, that's chaos. That would probably be bad for the business of baseball and any sport for both sides. Okay, so what the what happens is the owners and the players association they come to an agreement in 1976 to kind of regulate that, and what they come up with is you have to serve six years to become a free agent, right? The the team has your rights for six years, okay? Um, you can only play with them for those six years unless they decide otherwise. After that, you can become a free agent, okay? Um, and this is huge. I mean, this is it's hard to understate how massive this is in the first couple of years. You know, baseball salaries shoot up because now you can have multiple teams bidding on this player as opposed to him being forced to play for, say, the Dodgers. Now the Braves, now the Phillies, now the the, the Mets, you know, the Red Sox, they can all bid on this player and that's going to drive up their, their price. Um, baseball is still kind of looking at the, the last collective bargaining agreement between the owners and the players union. You may have noticed this happening in the last couple months. Baseball season started late because they're trying to come to an agreement. Um, baseball players wanted a better solution for this. They wanted to get the free agency earlier. Okay. Um, it didn't happen that way. They did get some concessions from the owners towards that way, but uh, they didn't get all they wanted. You still have to serve six years to become a free agent. Um, the NFL kind of follows suit here. He had had limited free agency starting around this time, very limited, much more limited than the uh, MLB. They gain a much more open free agency in 1993. Okay. But baseball owners aren't done. You know, in, in, in 1985, from 1985 to 1987, they colluded with each other, which essentially means they all agree with each other um, to hold down salaries. What happens is they don't bid on free agents. There's these star players coming out as a free agent, say 1986. And everybody was like, wait a second, why are they not getting offers? from these various teams. There should be tons of bids on this guy. This doesn't seem right. Well, and it wasn't right. It was found out that actually the, the owners were colluding against the players so they wouldn't pay them more. And they were sued. The players sued them. The judge agreed with the players and the baseball owners owed them a lot of money and lost wages. Um, so they didn't try to do that again. But moving forward, we have free agency now, right? That's great. But this doesn't mean labor trouble stop, okay? Um, there are plenty of strikes and lockouts. So a strike is when the players, aka the employees, the workers, decide not to work. Um, a lockout is when the owners don't allow the players to come to work. Okay, so they're they're two different sides of the same coin. They're not the same thing. Um, Major League Baseball, their first player strikes in 1972, right around Kurt Flood. It's very short. I don't believe they lose any games in the season. 1981 is a bigger one. They do lose games in the season, but they play the World Series. 1994 is famous because. 
But the strike the strike lasted so long, there was no World Series. It's the first time there hasn't been a World Series since 1904. Okay, and that turned a lot of fans against baseball. People were really pissed about that. Um, I, I can't remember this from my own memory. I was born in 1994. Um, but from what I've read, people were very, very upset. And a lot of them vowed not to come to baseball, come back to baseball. Now, they, a lot of them did come back because of, well, a steroid-fueled home run chase a few years later. Um, but that was a very trying time for baseball. That strike actually lasted in 1995, the early, year, early, early days of 95. So baseball players are striking a lot. NFL players are striking. 1982, they lose a couple games in the season. 1987, they strike. And what NFL teams do, and they say, we don't want to lose games, so we're going to hire these replacement players to come in and play. So for a few games, you had you know low-level former college players that were picking guys off the street, really old guys, really young guys, just to play the game so they could keep playing and making money. It was a much worse product. Um, but eventually the, the real players came back a few games later. Um, NFL owners, they locked out the players in 2011. You might be too young to remember that, but I certainly remember that. I was in high school and it was a really, people thought they were going to lose games, um, but they didn't. They settled it before the regular season started. NBA owners also locked out their players in 98, 99. I believe about 30 games were lost that year. Eh, between 20 and 30 games were lost that year. Um, and then 2011, they lost about 15 games. Okay. And that's, I also, that's happening around the same time that NFL lockout happened. I remember that very well. Um, NHL players struck in 1992, but you may be more familiar with the fact that NHL owners locked out the players much more often. Um, they lost some time in 94, 95. They locked out the entire season in 04 and 05. There was no hockey season 2004, 2005. I was a little kid during that. I remember that. Um, and then 2012, 2013, they only lost a few games, I think. I clearly forgot to update this slide. I should have updated this. Um, at this time last year, it looked very strong, like there would be a player strike into the season because what happens is they have to collectively bargain an agreement with the owners that lays out everything that governs baseball. I think it's every five years. And the players had a lot of issues with the owners, notably that the owners were taking a larger share of the economic pie a larger share of the money than the players thought was just. And frankly, I'm on the player's side in this. Um, but if you had noticed, if you paid attention to this during the year, um, you may have noticed that a lot of the media was actually on the side of the players here. Okay. So over the last 50 years of all this stuff I've been talking about, okay, um, public opinion has gradually come around to agree with the players more than the owners. We're going to talk about this in the next lecture next week, but um, money has exploded in sports, absolutely exploded the last 40 years. And people are realizing that, hey, look, if you know the players aren't getting that money, then the owner just gets a lot more. Billionaires become richer. So you know what? I support the players trying to get some of that money that they are causing to be valuable, right? Because without the great players, nobody's going to watch these games. All right. So um, they did strike, or excuse me, they didn't strike. Um, during the season, you only lost a few games, I believe. Um, a few days at the beginning of the regular season were lost, but all the teams are going to make up those games, so you're still going to get a full schedule. Um, but there has been a lot of labor unrest throughout these sports. Let's talk about this. How about players coming into professional leagues? Okay, let's think about going from the high school high school to the pros. All right, in baseball, you can go right from high school to be a professional. If you, if you choose to go to college, you have to stay at least three years or two years if you're a certain age coming out of high school. But let's just say three years, okay? Um, in football, no, you have to go three years, right? In hockey, hockey's a little different because you can play for junior leagues when you're a high schooler, which is like basically professional. Um, so NHL is like a yes, but not really. Um, Basketball is no, at least right now. And basketball is no for a long time, okay? Baseball, you've always been able to come out of high school. Um, basketball, for a long time, you couldn't, okay? The NBA rule was that you had to spend – you had to be four years out of high school to go to the NBA. Will Chamberlain actually tried to fight this. He, he left college as a junior and said – he left Kansas as a junior and said, I should be able to play in the NBA. The NBA says, no, you're not. I don't care how good you are, Will. You're not coming to the league. And so he played for the Globetrotters for a year, and then he came in the NBA. 
And, you know, oh, ho-hum, averaged 50 points a game. I think, I don't know if he did, no, as a rookie, I think he averaged 37. I think he averaged 50 a game like three years in, but the dude was a stud, right? He's obviously ready for it. Um, but you think why the NBA would do that and why they have the rules they have. Well, actually, let me step back. Take a step back. Four years out of high school, you get the NBA. Spencer Haywood comes around. Okay, this is Spencer Haywood up here. All right. Uh, he's one of the play, he's one of the figures you can um, write your final paper on. He's a really fascinating character. Spencer Haywood is a star basketball player at the University of Detroit Mercy. Okay, he averages like 30 points a game his uh, junior year. He is an Olympian in 1968. Okay, that's at the beginning of his college career. He's the, I believe, the MVP of the Olympics that year. Um, he's an incredible player. Okay, but Spencer Haywood leaves, I believe, after his sophomore or his junior year and answers the draft. And the NBA tells their teams, you better not draft him because you're not allowed to. Now, he's drafted by the ABA. Okay, the ABA is a competitor to the NBA at this point. The ABA gets um, merged with the NBA in about five years after this. Okay, um, but a, an NBA team actually takes him. The Seattle Supersonics take him. And they kind of work with him to fight against that rule. So Spencer Haywood, with the Sonics' help, sues the NBA. But he wins. Kirk Flood loses two years later. Spencer Haywood wins. Um, it doesn't go to the Supreme Court like Kirk Flood's does. Um, but Spencer Haywood wins. The court says, yes, you, there shouldn't be a restriction on when you can enter the workforce like that. Right? If I want to get a job in high school, I can. If I want to get a job, I can at least apply for it. They don't have to accept me necessarily, but they have to at least take my application. And the court's saying, well, you should be the same thing here. So now, because of that, you can enter the NBA and some of these other sports before your college graduation. Um, and Spencer Haywood's really the, the forefront of that. He's the guiding force for that. And he does become a pretty good player in the NBA with the Supersonics. Um, so that opens the gate. You see Moses Malone down here a few years after that. He becomes the first player drafted out of college or, excuse me, out of high school. Um, it's an ABA. The ABA drafts him, I believe it's the Utah, the Utah Stars. Um, and still, you draft to right out of high school. It still doesn't become popular um, to draft out of high school until you see him right here. You may recognize this guy. This is Kevin Garnett um, in 1995 is drafted first overall, or excuse me, was he first overall? I should know this off the top of my head. He's without out a first round pick. I, I should know if he's first overall or not. I, I believe he is. I believe he's first overall. Um, but he comes right out of high school. People are like, whoa, that's unusual to take a high school guy that early. First of all, it's unusual to take one at all. But he was so good his fresh his rookie year that other teams felt, oh, okay, now we feel comfortable taking them. Kobe Bryant is drafted the next year out of high school. Um, and that becomes a big thing until – the NBA puts a one and done rule in after the 2005 draft and says you must be one year out from your high school graduating class to come to the NBA. So most of that means that guys go to college for a year. Um, but more recently, um, players have been kind of challenging that indirectly. Um, they might go play overseas professionally. They might go to college for a year. They might also join the G League, right? The G League is the minor league for the NBA. They now have a team called uh, Ignite which will take guys who just graduated high school and they'll play in the G League against professionals for a year and then they can be drafted in the NBA. Um, you also have these leagues springing up for high schoolers or right out of high schoolers like Overtime Elite, leagues like that that are um, kind of taking, I wouldn't say taking precedence over the college route, but they're, they're, they're taking more players away from who would be playing in college, right? But a lot of those guys who are playing in college for a year before the 2005 one and done rule would have gone right to the NBA. So that's something to consider. Like, is that fair to make these guys wait a year? It's great for the NBA, right? Now they have more tape on this guy. They get free development in college. You know, they don't have to pay to develop this guy. The college is doing it for him. They get an older, more mature player coming out. It's great for the NBA. But is it great for the player? I don't know. Also, think about the concept of a draft, okay? Let me, let me, let me give you this scenario here. Say... I was I were the best player, the best teacher in South Jersey. I'm not. I'm definitely not. But let's just say, thank you, argument. I was, and I want to decide where I got to work. There'd probably be a ton of schools bidding to have me, but I could choose where I wanted to go to school, or where I wanted to go to work at a certain school. No, nobody's forcing me to work at a certain place. You know, I don't have to go to the worst school just because they finish the worst and they get the first crack at me. 
that seems ridiculous, right? If you're the best teacher, you have to go to the worst school. That's ridiculous. But that's what's happening in the draft, right? If you're the best player coming out, you have to go play for the team who drafts you. If you're the number one overall pick, you don't really have bargaining power. You go wherever the, that worst team takes you. And that you might not have thought of the draft that way before, but it's a little weird. Um, it, again, it's great for the leagues, right? Because they don't want just two teams being awesome all the time because they can pay for, they have the most money to pay for all the best players. So I understand that. Like I, I do, I do get why a draft is important for that. You know, a league can't be successful if it's just two rich teams buying all the best players and everybody else is terrible. On the other hand, it's really unfair for the players. Like they have no say in where they go. You might hear sometimes how when you get towards the end of the NFL draft, especially you hear, you know, Mel Kuyper Jr. or some draft analyst say, hey, you know what? We're in the seventh round, but if I were a player, I'd rather not be drafted because then I get to choose where I sign. Right? And that's a legitimate question. Would you rather be drafted in the seventh round and have to go to that um, that city, that team, or be undrafted? You have five teams offer you bids, and you can pick which one you want to go to. So I'm not saying what's right or wrong. You know, I'm not really sure on this. I'm just saying it raises some interesting questions about you know what's fair for the athlete, what's fair for the worker, and what's best for the league. Uh, when you think about just the concept of a draft. Today, um, in terms of this kind of athletes' rights, athletes' empowerment, name, image, and likeness is huge. Um, you probably have heard this term by now, if you follow college sports at all. It basically means college athletes can monetize their social media, they can do endorsement deals, they can sell merchandise, etc. Whereas before, last year, they couldn't do that at all. That would be a violation. They had to be completely amateur. Um, but in the past couple of years, states started making laws that would allow this. The NCAA, of course, I'm no fan of the NCAA. I think that's a terrible organization. Um, they were behind this. They were fighting it tooth and nail to the end. And why that's bad is that they didn't get ahead of it. Right. And now once there was a lot of um, a lot more fan and public support for the NIL, then the NCAA couldn't really dictate the terms for it. They just kind of had to accept it or get run over by the steamroller. So the NCAA approved NIL legislation late last June. And now for the last year, that's been the law of the land. So while college can't directly pay a player, um, they can make money from various other ventures. You can have donors at the school basically pay for those players to come to school. You could have coaches offer players to transfer to their school by giving them more money. Something that, you know, as recently as 10, 15 years ago would be shocking scandal. And now it's acceptable. Um, Tennessee just got hit with, with some really bad recruiting violations by the NCAA last week. Nobody really cares because the NCAA, first of all, is super hypocritical. Um, nobody really likes the NCAA. But secondly, the, the train has just moved so far in the last 10 to 15 years on how people view college athletes and whether they should be able to partake in monetary benefits that they get. They essentially get the school um, that people are agreeing with this now. Now. Again, I'm I'm generally in favor of NIL, if you ask me, but it is a little bit of a wild west right now. Think back to when I talked about free agency just starting in baseball and the players and the owners had to come to an agreement on you had to spend six years being a free agent because if you're everybody were a free agent every year, it'd be chaos, right? That's essentially what's happening right now. Uh, you have a one, you now don't have to sit out a year if you transfer as a college football player, basketball player, and you can make money. Uh, off your name, image, and likeness. This is basically meant free agency every single year. Um, and it's an absolute wild west. And while I think it is good in general to have these things, I, I think there needs to be more regulations put in against it. The problem is the NCAA had fought this for so long, they didn't get ahead of it. And now everybody's against them. Nobody likes the NCAA. So if they try to put regulations in, the genie's already out of the bottle, is what I'm trying to say. Genie's already out of the bottle. It's only going to get wackier from here. Um, and really, I blame the NCAA for that. But, you know, 20 years ago, most people were definitely dead set against the players getting any money, you know, because it's the quote unquote amateur ideal. You should be playing for the love of the game, for the love of your university, your community, which I'm totally a fan. Like, I think that's great. However, you also have to recognize at the biggest universities, you know, the Texas is the Alabamas, the Notre Dames, the Ohio States. These athletic departments are making hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes. 
And that's because of those players, right? People are paying to see those players. So I think it is fair that they can partake in some of that money that they are earning their schools. But we also have to be aware, most schools don't make money in athletics. You know, um, let's just pick an example. Rowan does that definitely does not make money from their athletics. Stockton definitely, they, they lose money. Um, even a school like Temple probably loses money from athletics. Villanova might even lose money from athletics. Um, so really most colleges, they don't make as much, as much money as you think they do from athletics. It's only a really small set of schools that do. However, the ones that do make money, it's because of the players in the field. And people are recognizing now that they deserve some kind of cut of that. Now, is that going to be coming to where they're going to be paid a salary by their schools and be made employees? That may happen sooner than we think. Uh, Northwestern football players about eight years ago actually tried to unionize. They tried to become a union, um, and they took their case. I don't know if it went to the Supreme Court, but it went pretty far up. Um, but the National Labor Relations Board declared they're not employees, therefore they cannot unionize. They might not decide that way if that happens again. Um, so a lot's going on right here. Um, and I just give you some examples of some player merchandise you can buy. This is Kyle Hamilton when he's at Notre Dame. This is Brian Robinson, a running back at Alabama, which would have been super, super illegal a year ago, a little over a year ago in the NCAA. You wouldn't, you know, been suspended big time for this. But now it's okay, which, again, I'm generally in favor of, but it's gone uh, pretty far off the rails at this point, and that's the NCAA's fault. Um so public opinion has swung a lot on free agency. It has swung a lot on name, image, and likeness to where people are more on the athlete side than they were on the owner's side before. Okay, and that's a long process that's happened that we just went over. All right, so that's a decent amount going on there. Your primary source analysis today is a really interesting letter. It's short. It's kind of similar to the one you did last week. Or not last week, two weeks ago. Um, the FDR letter to the baseball commissioner. It's very short. It's two paragraphs, two short paragraphs. Uh, I also posted this on uh, Canvas so you have a, you can get a longer look at it and a closer look at it because I can understand it might be hard to read. So it's on Canvas. Check it out there. This is Kurt Flood writing to the commissioner of baseball. OK, and he's telling the um, uh, the commissioner saying, listen, look, I want I would love to play baseball in 1970, but I don't think it's fair that I have to play for the Phillies. I think I could should be able to go anywhere I want. Um, he's saying, I don't think I should be a piece of property. Think about what that means in terms of what I said before about being seen as slaves, the fact that he's black in that, the fact that players don't have the rights to choose where they can work. Analyze what you think, just this letter, what you can what you can understand from this letter about the greater kind of conflicts and issues that players are facing against owners at mm -hmm. this time. Um, I think you can get a lot out of that. This is a really cool artifact um, from Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood's a very interesting guy. Um, yeah, I probably should have put. I think I think I might have put him as a topic. Well, I should be able to remember this offhand. I think he's a topic that you can write about for your final paper. And I think that'd be a great topic if you did choose that. Um, all right, so make sure you do. Really start thinking about your final paper now if you haven't already and talk to me a bit so he can talk to me about it so he can help you out with it. Um, but yeah, make sure you contribute to the discussion by Sunday. Also, do your primary source analysis by Sunday. Please check out the comments I put on my prep with those. They're meant to guide you. I've seen improvement from most of you, so that's good. Um, I think the discussion has been getting better. Your PSA has been getting better. So keep up the good work on that front. Um, you guys are doing awesome so far in this class. Uh, let's finish strong. All right. So you're going to see me on this, I believe one more time, maybe two, but the second one will be a pretty short one to wrap everything up. Um, all right. So I'm going to stop the recording. Should be on YouTube soon. Check it out. Like subscribe, do all that stuff, all the fun stuff.